Good afternoon. I'm Paddy Tillett, President of the City Club. <clears throat> Welcome to a program focusing on the future of Pacific Northwest Energy with special guest Ralph Kavanagh, Senior Defense Attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, but first, of course, some announcements. There'll be an orientation for new members immediately after this forum in the lounge next door. And um, today we'd like to uh, welcome new member Kim Crossman, who's Executive Director of the Northwest Service Academy. Kim, welcome. Once again, we're delighted to welcome members of the Lincoln High School Constitution team who are uh, in a table down here, and we shall advance the privilege of asking questions to you uh, when it comes to question time, because you're usually rather good at it. Join us on Friday the 1st of February for the State of the State message from the Governor of Oregon, John Kitzhaber, and that'll be here at the MAC. If you haven't looked at our website recently, there are treats in store for you. Check out www.pdxcityclub.org to access research reports, past club program presentations, upcoming events, and membership information. Next week, we'll kick off our annual membership drive. All of you who are members are challenged to bring at least one new member between February the 1st and the end of March. This is a way to help both the club and the community without spending a dime, so it's a good thing to do. Please use the form in this week's bulletin to make your pledge of assistance in that. Our board host today is Ginny Cooper, member of the Board of Governors and Director of Multnomah County Libraries. She will ask the first question of our speaker. Following Ginny's question, we'll open the program to questions from City Club members and members of Lincoln High School, Please line up behind the mi microphone before Ginny has finished so that we can make the most of our speaker's time. Please identify yourself as a member of the City Club and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part by corporate underwriting from Enterprise Rent-A-Car, from Pacific Care, and from Warehouser Company Foundation. We're very grateful for their support. Ralph Kavanagh makes a welcome return to City Club today after an eight-year hiatus. Through his initiatives, he's been credited with billions of dollars in energy savings and with effective protection of the natural environment in numerous locations. A graduate of the Yale Law School, Mr. Kavanagh co-directs the energy program at the Natural Resources Defense Council, a non-profit environment advocacy organization that he joined in 1979. He also serves the U.S. Secretary of Energy's Advisory Board and on the board of eSource, a Colorado-based energy services company. Mr. Kavanagh has held appointments as a visiting professor at Stanford and Bolt Hall Law Schools and as a lecturer in law at the Harvard Law School, in spite of being a Yaley. He's a former member of the Energy Engineering Board of the National Academy of Sciences and the Advisory Council of the Electric Power Research Institute. Besides these prestigious positions, Mr. Kavanagh has maintained a long-standing commitment to energy efficiency and renewable energy. He's vice chair of CIRT, the Center for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Technologies. He's also a founding board member of the Northwest Energy Coalition. In 1996, he received the Heinz Award for Public Policy and the Bonneville Power Administration's Award for Exceptional Public Service. From what little I've read of your work, most of us have been blaming the wrong people for last year's energy crisis. To set the record straight and to broaden our understanding of the future of energy in the Pacific Northwest, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Ralph Kavanagh. I want to uh, spend the next few minutes provoking some questions from this audience about the great Western energy crisis of 2000 to 2001. You've all heard about it. Some of you are wondering how much of it was my fault. Uh, and what I want to try to do is to bring a new perspective on the origins, on some of the largely unsung hometown heroes and heroines who are helping dig us out of it, and most important, what we're doing and must do together to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. Before I do that, I, I, I think I should begin by acknowledging, though, that the Natural Resources Defense Council has a decided weakness for Oregon and Oregonians. 
Now, nominally, NRDC is a national or environmental organization with an international agenda. But I think it's fair to point out in this room that four of our founders were native Oregonians. A longtime trustee is a towering figure named Tom Stoll, well known to many in this room. And that our first regional project focused on the Northwest and continues to do so more than three decades after its founding. Uh, I was assigned that work when I arrived at NRDC in 1979, and nobody has been able to pry it away from me. I last uh, appeared in this very distinguished forum, as Patty mentioned, uh, almost eight years ago, in April of 1994. And on the whole, I think you were wise to uh, be deliberate about extending another invitation. Because uh, the timing allows me, in just two seamlessly connected addresses to the Portland City Club, to open and close an entire era in the history of the electricity industry. Now, that era began two days before my last appearance here, with the announcement by the Pal California Public Utilities Commission on April 20th, 1994, of a bold new market-driven experiment in restructuring the electricity sector, which would dramatically reduce electricity rates in California by the end of the decade. At the same time, the Bonneville Power Administration announced that market pressures were forcing a re-examination of the agency's longtime commitment to energy conservation and indeed to all of the other long-term investments on the agency's agenda. That re-examination would soon sweep the entire region later in 1994 with frightening consequences that became fully visible only very recently. Now, the west-wide electricity and natural gas crisis of 2000 to 2001 was an experience that almost no one here has any interest in repeating, although I think it's important to point out that it was followed immediately by an almost equally spectacular but little understood success, to which I'm going to return shortly with some details. I want also to emphasize, uh, because a focus on the crisis lends a necessarily somewhat dour note to the proceedings, some of the quite wonderful things that are happening now to help dig us out of it. I note that the Oregon Energy Trust is reviving Oregon's conservation efforts statewide under its new leader, Margie Harris, that what I think is the most effective region-wide conservation program in the country is being ably orchestrated out of Portland under Margie Gardner at the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. I love the symbolism, as I know all of you do, that when the Secretary of Energy announced that Steve Wright yesterday was being confirmed as BPA Administrator, uh, we were all reminded that the first job Steve Wright had at Bonneville was in the Conservation Department 21 years ago. Uh, although conservation will be the focus of my remarks today, I also celebrate the fact that the Northwest has emerged as the center of a worldwide wind energy renaissance, thanks in no small part to the hometown leadership of the Renewable Northwest Project under Rachel Shimshack and the Bonneville Environmental Foundation under Angus Duncan and Senator Mark Hatfield. Uh, in short, thanks in no small parts to all that hometown leadership and all those hometown institutions, and there is no city other than Portland that has a roster anything like that in the world, we dug ourselves a very deep hole. And if things are looking up, it's still important now to understand exactly where we started to go wrong back in 1994 and what we must do now to stay on course. And so let me go immediately to what went wrong or what I think was the most important thing that went wrong back when the California PUC issued that decision just before my City Club remarks in April of 1994. The, and the most important part of the California PUC decision was a redefinition of what had since Edison's time been one of the most important functions of our electric utilities. And I would analogize that function to the job of a portfolio manager. That is one of the most important things that electricity, electric utilities did at that time, and for decades before that time, was to select the mix of investments in electricity generation that collectively would ensure an affordable and reliable electric supply. Uh, and electric utilities had to make many difficult and sometimes risky decisions about what resources to invest in, how much to spend, how to stagger the portfolio, how to diversify it. Different kinds of power plants, different kinds of fuels. For most of the decades after Edison's time, this was viewed as pretty much just a problem of what kind of power plant to build and buy. And it was here in the Northwest, starting in the late 70s, that a different vision of portfolio management began to emerge, and one that put a lot of emphasis on a new kind of electricity resource, which we called, quite simply, electricity conservation. 
And the fundamental notion there, and it was a simple one and rather appealing, was that if a utility could save energy more cheaply than it could be produced at a power plant, that was a pretty good investment for customers and stockholders alike. History will record that the first utility finance investments in energy conservation anywhere on Earth occurred, of course, out of a Portland-based utility, then being run by a gentleman with some vague recognition in this room named Dom Frisbee, who just happens to be sitting in front of me. And so if I get this wrong, he'll be quick to jump up and correct me. But I think Don was the first person to take that insight about the availability of conservation opportunities at lower cost than generation and put it to work on a grand scale, which he and his friend Tom Stoll brought forward in Hood River, Oregon in the early 80s, where the first really large scale conservation investments to back off power plants were successfully made. And where we learned that entire communities could be galvanized into action at a scale no one had thought possible if given the right incentives and the right education. And the emergence of conservation as a resource for utility portfolio managers was invented here, brought forward and nurtured by the Northwest Power Planning Council under the leadership of its inaugural executive director, Ed Sheets. And it became, by the mid-1990s, a cornerstone of successful electric resource portfolio management throughout the West and indeed throughout North America. And then we introduced the California Public Utilities Commission. And its insight, unique then and now, was that we didn't really need utilities to be portfolio managers at all. Uh, that in fact, this was a function better left to, and here I quote exactly the phrase of the California PUC in that order two days before my last city club address, we should rely instead on the genius of the marketplace. And by that, the California PUC meant that entrepreneurs would come forward and offer their own portfolios and sign up their own customers if only the utilities were removed from this job and if only competition was allowed to flourish. Around the time of my City Club address, I was debating this new concept with some of its proponents uh, who were uh, aggressive entrepreneurial types uh, who uh, loved to talk about the virtues of competition in portfolio management. Uh, and I asked what I hoped would be the killer rhetorical question to one of the enthusiasts who was uh, Telling, telling everyone that we didn't need utilities to do this, that the market would do it. And I basically said, as, as, he, as he spun the tale of all of the exciting new services, all of the exciting new portfolio managers, all of the exciting new choices that would emerge under the Cal California PUC's vision, I said, what's in this for my mother? Uh, and he had anticipated this question. Uh, and he instantly fired back, well prepared as he was, for the first time, she's going to be able to hedge her fuel price risks. <laughs> My mother then and now has a full life. She had not previously felt this as an enormous want or need. I suspect that many of you had not either. And the plain fact of the matter was that in the years following the California PUC's decision, the competitive portfolio managers somehow never got any traction in California or anywhere else. The exciting new market choices never really emerged. And by May of the year 2000, essentially everyone in California, having failed to take advantage of any of the exciting portfolio choices that may or may not have been available, essentially everyone in California was riding the spot market. We didn't know we were riding the spot market. Most of us had no clue that any of this was going on at all, but that's what was happening. There was no portfolio manager. There was no one investing on our collective behalf to ensure an affordable and reliable supply of electricity. We were in the spot market. And the spot market, in May of 2001, began to go haywire. At that point, what happened basically was that the Western power grid came under severe pressure. There are many reasons for that. The, the, it stopped raining in the Northwest and hydropower reserves went down sharply. There was rapid demand growth, not so much in California, where the crisis was most keenly felt, but in the Western states surrounding California. Uh, and there were a number of significant retrenchments in conservation throughout the region that I'll come back to in a moment, not just in California. But the fundamental thing that happened was the grid came under severe stress. And as the grid came under severe stress, electricity prices went up by an astonishing five-fold. And then, in the months following, they went up by tenfold. And this continued for month after month, from May of 2000 through June of 2001. The Pacific Gas and Electric Company went bankrupt in January of 2001, the largest electric supplier in the West. The Southern California Edison Company was tottering on the verge of bankruptcy, as were the other principal California utilities. The collateral damage in the Northwest and other Western states is well known in this room. 
If the Department of Energy had not literally seized the electric and gas lines in January of 2001 and forced the continued delivery of electricity and natural gas, electric and gas supplies into California would have stopped. The fiscal crisis continued, and by May of 2001, the National Electric Reliability Council, which is the official arbiter of these matters, issued its predictions for what was going to happen in California during the summer of 2001. The minimum estimate, assuming normal weather, was 250 hours of electricity interruptions affecting an average of 2 million people per interruption. And if there were extreme weather conditions, uh, and if any number of very plausible adverse contingencies emerged, electric blackouts would be a daily occasion in California, and they would spread into the adjoining regions. And I think everyone remembers that. Now, in, in contemplating for just a moment the nature of the challenge that California faced at that point, recognize that from 1970 to 2000, in terms of electricity use in the United States, in this region in California, the record was one of unrelenting and continuing growth in consumption. From 1973 to 2000, electricity consumption in the United States doubled. Even as the use of petroleum only went up by about 10%, natural gas use basically flat, electricity was the huge growth commodity in the energy sector. Electricity was something that could, the use of which could never go down, and there was no year except one in the 28 years between 1973 and 2000 when the United States had ever reduced its electricity use, and that was during a very severe recession from 1981 to 1982. So we're looking at a commodity whose use, uh, at least the conventional wisdom said, could not decline, except in conjunction with very severe economic dislocation. Uh, and to further uh, accelerate and uh, bring home the challenge, it was widely believed at that time that California also faced an imminent explosion of electricity use in conjunction with its high-tech economy uh, and its increasing reliance on internet-related businesses. And, and all of you remember, uh, many of these studies were F funded, I must point out, by the coal industry, always eager to uh, demonstrate new uses for the product. But the conventional wisdom of the time was that in the emerging internet economy and the high-tech uh, applications that it was uh, spreading throughout the country, there was an incipient surge in electricity use already built into the economy. So that's the challenge that faces California and the West in May of 2001. And what I simply want very briefly to report to you, uh, and, and I hope in the process to explode a few urban myths is what happened after May 2001. And I think in California what happened after May 2001 was quite simply the most successful statewide conservation campaign ever conducted. Now there are a couple of things that are, first of all, how many hours of rolling blackouts were there after May of 2001? I, as I hope everyone here is aware the reassuring number is zero. All of you think it's because of the mild weather, because that urban myth started somewhere in the beltway that I haven't been able to track down. But in fact, for the state of California, the summer of 2001, like the summer of 2000 before it, was a relatively hot summer, about the 25th hottest in the last 110 years of record. In the Southwest, which contributed substantially to the overall needs of the power grid, it was one of the hottest summers on record. And the only place in the Western grid where it was relatively mild was a narrow corridor extending roughly from Eugene, Oregon to Seattle. <laughs> Bravo to all of you. But it wasn't a mild summer. And at the same time, the California economy not only didn't collapse, it continued to grow, although at a slower pace. Uh, employment growth in California continued at least through September. And yet, California was able to reduce its electricity use overall by about 6% from January to September of 2001 compared to a year earlier. And at the same time, the use at peak periods uh, during the time when the system was under greatest stress, the reduction was more than 12%. Now, there are a whole host of reasons why this happened, uh, in, including very effective public education, uh, including a surge of effort by our utility portfolio managers, whose importance was newly appreciated, who got new resources and went out in the field and deployed them very aggressively. Emergency upgrades and efficiency standards governing buildings and equipment, all of the policies that we collectively had developed in the West, many invented in the Northwest, were providentially available and were brought forward and deployed on an unprecedented scale. Now that, in a nutshell, is California, and we can talk about it more in the question and answer period. I want to focus now, in the, and for the remainder of my remarks, on the Northwest. And here in the Northwest, as we moved into May of 2000, first of all, a tragedy to report. And that was, again, after, since my last appearance in 1994, and since Bonneville's then newly emergent concerns, conservation investment in the Northwest essentially collapsed throughout the utility sector. 
And the whole harrowing story is clear to see on the website of the Northwest Power Planning Council, which is, of course, nwcouncil.org. Uh, and what you can see there in graphic form between 1994 and 2000 is a reduction of about 80 percent in conservation investment and energy savings for the whole Northwest utility sector. At the worst possible time, clearly contributing to the growth of pressure on the power grid, we were waiting for a bad series of events to set it off, and we got it. Then, because we had damaged and reduced our conservation infrastructure so badly, we had trouble being, bringing it back up quickly. And so as the Northwest tried to cope with the energy and gas crisis, the electricity and gas crisis of 2000 to 2001, we had to do things like shut down major industry. We had to run diesel generators, some of the dirtiest forms of power supply known to man. And we had to put the endangered fish resources of the region under even more severe pressure. And we now remember vividly all of us, some of the cost of dismantling portfolio management. In the Northwest, it wasn't because of a policy judgment. There was no California PUC decision. What there was instead was widespread uncertainty throughout the industry about what the future held and a corresponding inability to invest long term in almost anything but conservation emphatically included. Now, where I want to close my remarks today is with a focus on what I hope we can all agree is a revival of understanding, concern, and emphasis on this utility portfolio management function and on the conservation investment piece of it in particular. And I want to leave you with some positive thoughts of why I think we're going to win. The most important reason why we're going to win is that Oregon is much better positioned to restore utility portfolio management to full vigor than California was. And the reason for that is that Oregon chose a different model of electric industry restructuring, informed in, fa in part by those vivid events in California. Uh, and the most important part of the Oregon never made California's mistake of simply trying to leave portfolio management to the genius of the marketplace. Oregon recognized that utilities needed to continue to have these responsibilities, at least for small residential and business customers, left those responsibilities unambiguously with the utility sector, and also provided explicitly, as California did, and this is the one policy the two regions happily held in common, Oregon provided explicitly for reserving a small fraction of everyone's utility bill for continuing investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy resources. And it is that reservation, which becomes fully effective on March the 1st, that will provide the major immediate impetus for revival in energy efficiency investment in Oregon, unless we make an awful mistake, which some in the legislature have flirted with in response to the budget crisis, of reaching over to those absolutely critical investments and moving them somewhere else, uh, an action fairly uh, analogous, I think, in light of recent events to eating the seed corn. And I know that this audience has heard about this danger in the past week. I know we were all delighted this week to see that the governor's proposal for resolving the crisis did not include eating the seed corn. But until the crisis is resolved, I hope everyone here will join NRDC in watching this one like a hawk. We're on the verge of a revival, an urgently and desperately needed revival of conservation investment in Oregon. We have the opportunity to keep alive the resurgence of renewable energy that started this year. To lose that now and to face a rerun of this movie that we just saw is something I hope no one in this room will stand for. But at the same time, while I think Oregon is well positioned for the revival, there is one important element not yet in place. And I want to refer briefly to it because I think it's part of the reason why those of you who followed these, year, these events with me over the last two and a half decades have seen such a cyclical process in the region in terms of periods of enthusiasm for conservation and long-term sustainable energy investment varying with periods when it seemed like all the hands were off the wheel and all of the investments were collapsing. And the fundamental reason why we stay on a roller co coaster and the fundamental reason why we seem to jump from crisis to crisis and why we haven't been able to sustain the progress we need over time goes, I think, first and foremost to a failing in the incentives that we are providing to our utility portfolio managers, public and private alike. Two fundamental questions. If, if, if I succeeded in convincing you that this is an important function, like one of the most important in society, like if you get it wrong, you don't have reliable and affordable electricity anymore, and we know that. A couple of interesting questions are, first of all, how much are utilities and their managers rewarded for good electric resource portfolio management? And specifically, how much are utilities and their managers rewarded for helping their customers reduce electricity and natural gas use, as Don Frisbee figured out how to do, uh, more cheaply than alternative forms of production? What are the rewards? 
And the sad truth is that under the way we handle the pricing of electricity and natural gas, not just in Oregon but around the country, there are no rewards. And it's worse than that. The financial health of the utility businesses is tied directly to increases in their sales. If they sell less electricity and natural gas, their shareholders take a hit if they're investor-owned utilities, and their financial health and their status in the rating services takes a hit if they're publicly owned utilities. Tying the financial health of utilities directly to increases in sales makes no sense if you're interested in encouraging utilities to promote conservation when it's cheaper than alternative forms of generation. And failing to provide any reward for good long-term resource portfolio management. What we've historically done in the Northwest as far as this portfolio management function goes is we've let utilities pass through the costs, period. If all you do is let people pass through the costs, the two things you can be sure of are the costs are likely to be higher than you'd like them to be, and you're not going to get a whole lot of entrepreneurial ingenuity or innovation built into the function. And I just want to submit to all of you that an urgent priority for Oregon, for the Oregon Public Utilities Commission, for all of the Oregon Public Utility Boards, has to be getting a better set of incentives in place as quickly as possible. If we don't change that, we won't make progress. And I want publicly to commend the leadership of Northwest Natural Gas and Portland General Electric and Pacificorp in bringing to the Oregon PUC in recent months and years some very innovative proposals for fixing this problem. There is much more still to do, much more work to be done by the utilities, their customers, and the PUC, but at least we've begun to move in the right direction. Our portfolio managers have figured out that they've got a problem. They're moving to try to fix it. They're going to need support and help from all of us. Uh, I, I noted in, in, whenever I uh, survey uh, great speeches to the City Club, I always like to look back to some of Don Hodell's remarks in the late 70s when he was the administrator of the Bonneville Power Administration. And Don Hodell, in one of his memorable speeches to all of you, uh, said, uh, it closed his remarks by saying that most people can't see the handwriting on the wall until their backs are up against it. <laughs> well, um, in, in, in that spirit, I just want to remind you all, I want to leave you all with one number that helps signify how much our backs were up against it and helps, I hope, uh, reinforce our resolve never to be here again or never to be in that predicament again. Uh, a simple question, if you ask, and, and it's gratifyingly directed to a jurisdiction to the south, if you ask how much bad portfolio management in the electric sector cost the state of California in 2000 and 2001, just in those two years, how much did bad portfolio management raise the cost of electricity above the average for the previous 10 years? For those two years alone, the answer is $40 billion dollars. That's a B. Two years alone. I think people are going to remember that. I think people are going to remember the collateral damage that those bad decisions spread beyond the borders of California. And I hope everybody in this room resolves with me to be, to take comfort, first of all, in the fact that we know how to fix this. Don Frisbee got us all off on the right foot 20 years ago. We know how to build a portfolio of conservation and renewable resources that can shield Oregonians from the next round of energy market upsets, wherever those upsets come from. We've got all of the right institutions in place. What we've got to do now is make sure they've got the right incentives, they've got the resources they need, and we've got to be vigilant against a renewal of the short-term thinking that ignited the great Western energy crisis. We now know how important our electric resource portfolio managers are. And with all of your help, they can bring us together into a sustainable and affordable energy future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, Mr. Cavanaugh, if you might not tell us just a little bit about how you personally we have, were affected by the California energy crisis, and particularly, do we thank you for causing it or for solving the problem? Uh, I gather uh, that, uh, and I, I have not actually read the book yet, that the new Nader book identifies me as the principal architect of the failed California restructuring experiment. Uh, Regular attendees uh, at City Club events know that my duties in the Northwest make it impossible for me to be the architect of anything of that scale outside the Pacific Northwest. But what I want to tell you all, actually it is important for you all to know the role of the environmental community in the development of the restructuring process in California, and I th also think by important and instructive analogy in Oregon. 
what the environmental community had, has tried to do is to insist on a couple of things. Um, the first is the continued in, importance of this portfolio management function, which really is where the investment comes that builds an energy future. Initially, the efforts to keep that function squarely focused and well regulated in California failed, and they failed as a result of the PUC orders. And at that point, what environmental groups tried to do successfully was to insist that investment in conservation and renewable energy had to remain alive and had to remain alive through a dedicated charge on electric bills. We also, by the way, took on the challenge. Our opponent said, make that, make that charge visible, transparent. Show the customers the charge. And we said we welcome that because it's our judgment that Californians and Oregonians and Washingtonians will be delighted to see that 3% of their electric bills being dedicated to efficiency and renewables. And indeed, they'll wonder why it isn't more. As a result of that action, which was taken as part of the restructuring and is the one part for which, yes, I will say I had a substantial role, I think it's fair to say that California was in better shape to launch the major statewide conservation effort that was required in 2001 that would otherwise have been the case. The good news for Oregonians is that Oregon, Oregon groups were more successful on one crucial issue than NRDC was in California, they were able to persuade the legislature, and they got some help from the hometown utilities on this, not to leave portfolio management to the genius of the marketplace. And so Oregon never got itself into a situation where the entire state was riding the spot market, which was what happened to us in California. Oregon still, I think, faces the challenge, as California does, of getting the incentives right for the portfolio managers on whom we'll all be relying in the future. Uh, but let me simply say that nothing that I have seen in California since 1996 has reduced my sense of the absolutely crucial importance of this role. I don't regret for a moment the rather aggressive opposition that I raised at the time to taking portfolio management away from the utility sector, and I'm now looking forward to being part of the restoration process. I want to congratulate all of my colleagues in Oregon for, I think, doing a much better job here and positioning the state to come out of its uh, current challenges in much better shape than otherwise would have been possible. And now I'd love to hear from some of the rest of you. Nikki Lynch, member. Uh, what are some specific examples of these incentives that you're referring to? The, uh, and, and, and this is a story that can be told both in California and the Pacific Northwest. The fundamental notion, if you're talking about utility investment in conservation, is that the hometown utility provides financial incentives for actions that improve the efficiency of energy use. My favorite kind of global example of this in terms of the really spectacular impact of doing this well over a period of years has to do with the refrigerator. Uh, by the mid-1970s, the typical refrigerator was the biggest user of electricity in American household. Uh, and utilities targeted refrigerators early on. They gave incentives for better equipment. And they kept raising those incentives, and they kept raising the standards, and they kept working with state and federal government to establish minimum efficiency standards for refrigerators going forward. And after 20 years of that, relentless, positive, incentive-based pressure, the average new refrigerator that you buy this year will use one-fourth as much electricity, one-fourth as much as the typical refrigerator of the mid-70s. That is a story in large measure of the effective mobilization of incentives from the utility sector. And all of you who have been part of the Northwest experience uh, over the past 20 years have seen your utilities at various times provide residential and commercial sector incentives for measures to improve efficiency of households, commercial buildings. 2001 brought some interesting new uh, initiatives forward, uh, very aggressive rewards for large reductions in savings. One, one quick anecdote from California, uh, for PG&E, uh, over the summertime period, an amazing one-third of customers reduced their electricity use by at least 20 percent. Uh, and in fact, the average reduction for that group, a third of the residential customer base, was 40 percent. Uh, and they did that no, without question, in part because of very strong incentives and, of course, equally strong public education, in part because of a fear that the lights would go out if they didn't. I don't want us to have to scare people to death to get those kinds of results, but it's heartening to see as you begin to disentangle all that happened in California, uh, how much of it built on the positive results of the utility programs that we all came to know first in Oregon and the Northwest. Uh, Jay Formick, City Club member. I'm also the executive director of a small nonprofit with a very large job, and that is helping low-income Oregonians keep their, their homes warm in the wintertime. Ralph, in California, when restructuring was created, I seem to recall there were provisions for creating a low-income bill payment assistance program. Uh, fortunately, the Oregon uh, variation on that theme 
uh, was a very generous $10 million introduced into the system. However, we are suffering a real crisis in, in, in near the end of January. We are already out of all the federal funding and the state funding created through the legislation is spoken for through the month of May. Um, where, where is California in this scheme? Uh, did their, their efforts to create bill payment assistance for low-income ratepayers come to any, any good end? Uh, in, in, indeed, they did, and I'm grateful for the question. Indeed, it should have been a greater focus of my remarks. A, an important part of the entire environmental and consumer effort in California as restructuring went forward was to guarantee that whatever else we lost, we would maintain support for low-income low income energy services, including targeted conservation programs. Uh, as a result, part of the dedicated 3 percent charge that I mentioned in California that was established in 1996 was specifically dedicated to low-income energy services. Then in 2001, when the world turned upside down, there were two important measures taken that I, I hope are helpful as precedents for you, Jay. Uh, one was the decision by the California Public Utilities Commission to exempt low-income customers from any of the electricity rate increases. Uh, as a consequence, I, by the way, those of you who are feeling bad about your utility bills should know that as a, I, I, I should have mentioned this when I was asked how the California restructuring had affected me personally, uh, my tail block electricity rate for the last kilowatt hours consumed as a result of the $40 billion overhang is now 26 cents a kilowatt hour, a number which any of you who uh, track your uh, monthly payments will view with a certain amount of pleasure if you think Californians suffer from an excessive sense of self-importance. Um, <laughs> at the same time, though, all of those increases were the low-income customers were spared those increases. Low-income defined as a fraction of federal poverty level. 175% is the number that's used in California. And there was an infusion of $240 million, special infusion in 2001, to deal with the immediate emergency. Now, everybody, what I think we all need to do together on this one, in addition to making sure that Oregon continues to make effective provision for low-income services, is get the federal government to increase the low-income services budget. I believe there is broad bipartisan support for that, and it will be one of NRDC's priorities over the next few months. Bill Savage, City Club member. Uh, you, you said that the uh, utilities have an incentive to sell more power. That right. That's kind of what drives What will change that to lead them to, to be, do more conservation? Now, now, Bill is inviting me to inflict on all of you a seminar in utility rate regulation, which would empty the room faster than almost anything I can think of. Uh, but let me try, nonetheless, to make, because this is not rocket science, to explain what needs to be done to break the link between utilities' financial health and the amount of electricity and gas they sell. What needs to be done is to make a small adjustment in rates every year to wash out the effects of unexpected, uh, unexpected changes in sales. Uh, basically, what you do every year is you see how much they sold, you compare it with the target that had been set for the year, and you do a true up, up or down, depending on whether they beat the target or fell under it. What that does is it essentially makes the utility management indifferent to the amount of electricity and gas they sell. Their financial health isn't affected by it. Now, I'm interested in more than just indifference in my portfolio manager. I'd like some positive motivation to do a good job. And so I think it is crucial, in addition to these small annual true-ups, to wash out the effect of increases in gas and electric sales to provide a positive incentive for doing a good job and in particular a positive incentive for saving electricity more cheaply than it can be produced. And it's that this challenge of how to create performance-based rewards for our electric resource portfolio managers is a challenge that everyone in the country and indeed the world is facing today. Nobody's figured out how to do it. For the better part of a century, what we've relied on is simple, stupid, pass-through measures that have had the result of linking financial health to sales. We know how to change it. Some of the critical precedents for beginning the change were actually set by the Oregon PUC back in 1998. Now it's just a matter of getting it done and adding some additional features that will make sure that this performance-based reward is firmly set. But we've got the institutions to do it, both in the Oregon PUC for Pacific Corp and Portland General, and for our major publicly owned utilities. And I hope what they get now from their informed publics, a wholly disproportionate part of which is gathered here today, uh, is a strong urging just to do it, do it right, uh, and make sure that we never again leave this absolutely crucial function uh, essentially to chance. <coughs> Lucas Marks, Lincoln Constitution member and City Club member. In San Francisco, they recently passed an initiative to authorize $100 million of taxpayer money to establish solar and wind resources. What do you think about the possibility of this kind of initiative passing in the Northwest? 
And uh, it, the, uh, in, in California and in San Francisco specifically, what voters have done is to basically authorize the use of revenue bonds, uh, which will be issued and repaid with proceeds from the resources themselves, uh, to accelerate the city's transition into renewable energy and get more conservation done. Uh, and this is a specialized application of the kind of good portfolio management I'm talking about. Uh, I absolutely think it's important. What we're basically doing here is finding financing mechanisms to mobilize more investment in efficiency in renewables. I, I, the focus of my remarks today has been on the, the fact that I think the most important of those mechanisms, the most important single mechanism, is the electric utility itself, the resource portfolio manager itself, because that's, that's the institution that's ultimately responsible for keeping the lights on and maintaining an affordable portfolio. But there are a whole lot of interesting ideas out there right now, of which the San Francisco uh, Initiative is one, uh, for supplementing that function and particularly for getting more investment into efficiency and renewables more quickly than the base portfolio management manager is doing. Uh, in the Northwest, an interesting analogy to that is the opportunity that all of you now have to direct a larger portion of your electric bill, if you want to, to renewable power supplies. Uh, and for those of you interested in seizing that opportunity immediately, I cannot resist making concretely available to you two nice resources. Uh, RNP.org has all of Oregon's green choices prominently displayed on it. And my personal favorite, and the one that I, have, uh, that I use myself, is the opportunity afforded by the Bonneville Environmental Foundation uh, to basically calculate your personal pollution associated with your energy use and offset every pound of it. Uh, with direct investment in new Northwest energy resources. Uh, and so those, are, those choices are popping up in the Northwest. I like the fact that there's a lot churning right now on efficiency and renewables. I think the public support is obvious. But I want to keep the focus today, at least, on the portfolio manager, because I think that's the most important single place where this is going to happen. Tom Dunn, I'm a member. I'd like to ask you a big vision question. Uh, with respect to a certain parameter. Uh, what do you see, looking way out into the future, as the ideal electrical system with respect to whether uh, the providers of that power are uh, private or public? Ah. <clears throat> The, the, uh, actually, for, for 23 years, this is, of course, a, a, the great test that uh, every Northwesterner faces. What's your preference? And actually, what I like about the Northwest, and the reason I've always, I'm going to duck that question just success, as successfully today as I have for 23 years, is I don't think there is an inherent, I don't think there's an inherent advantage to either public or private ownership. I like the fact that the Northwest has both. I like the fact that from time to time they compete rather aggressively with each other over who has the best sustainable energy record. I like the fact that, for example, the Eugene Water and Electric Board is my model for how public power should do resource portfolio management with its extraordinary commitment to energy efficiency and renewables. And I like the fact that Don Frisbee was inventing conservation resources from the platform of an investor-owned utility at about the same time eWeb was cranking up. So I love having both. Uh, I don't want to do without either. And I resolutely refuse to express a preference one over the other. <laughs> Lloyd Marbet, City Club member. Hi, Lloyd. How you doing, Ralph? Just fine. <laughs> I, too, was dismayed after you last spoke to the City Club to watch conservation investment basically be killed by re uh, deregulation in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, while we were all waiting for the free market portfolio of resources. In the meantime, we now confront a growing crisis of global warming. The legislature continues to be in the hands of utility lobbyists. We face the collapse of Enron. And instead of relying on a small fraction of utility investment in conservation and renewable energy, energy, uh, renewable energy resources, why not expand the vision? Why not use our state power authority provided for in the Oregon Constitution in 1932 to build a real portfolio of resources for Oregon's future, investing in conservation and renewable ener energy resources, and at the same time, taking over Portland General Electric, preventing a bankruptcy judge from selling off PGE's resources to the highest bidder. Uh, first of all, I, uh, Lloyd has presented in his customary understated way. Of, uh, <laughs> uh, of, and, and Lloyd, stay right there. Ralph, this, you bring it out of me. This, 
I want you all to know, there was a time when I was Lloyd Barbet's attorney, as he recalls, with, uh, with, uh, with mutual pleasure. We did some good things together. Um, this one, let me go this far with you. Uh, I do not want to be understood to say that the small fraction of the electric bill that Oregon and California devotes to efficiency and renewables should exhaust what we do by any means. The portfolio management function I'm describing is one in which utilities build on that minimum fraction, that that's a floor, not a ceiling. And that what they do is go out and invest aggressively beyond the floor. And Lloyd, I think you share my delight in the fact that the revival of wind power in the Northwest is happening in part because Pacific Corp's uh, wholesale marketing subsidiary impact did go beyond the floor uh, and became, <clears throat> at least for the Northwest, the most aggressive single investor in renewables. The reason I don't instantly leap at the vision of a, power, of a state power authority <clears throat> um, has something to do with the, the answer I gave to the last question, that I don't see an inherent advantage in either form of ownership. I think given the right incentives that either form of ownership can deliver, I remind you, Lloyd, that if we look back at the history of the Northwest over the past quarter century at different times, Public and private institutions together have been leaders, and public and private institutions together have fallen behind. Uh, there's a five-letter acronym that I'm not going to utter in this room uh, that was associated with nuclear energy development in the late 70s that was not the result of Don Frisbee shareholders making dumb decisions. And so I think either kind of ownership can screw up. I think either kind of ownership can do well. What I hope you and I can work on together is improving the incentives that both forms of ownership face, even as I know you will remain true to your vision, you'll keep fighting for a statewide power authority, and if, Lloyd, you could be in charge of it, I'd feel a whole lot better. Ralph, <laughs> Ralph, I believe we're in a crisis, and I don't believe you disagree with that. And I think the problem that we really face here is, is that under the current management of our energy resource system, we're not going far enough. And at the same time, we face losing access to the assets that we have in okay. the Pacific Northwest owned by PGE, and a state power authority provides us salvation in this, far better than we can relying on the existing system as it is. Uh, I respect that view. I, I also, in, in an attempt to bridge the gap as much as I can, want to second Lloyd's view that it, it matters a lot uh, how the future of Portland General is determined at the moment, uh, that I think we all have a collective stake in moving that in the right direction, and we know that the institution, now the owner, can't continue as a steward. So there, let's work together to make sure that comes in for a soft landing. The institution involved matters a great deal to uh, all of us, and that's part of the continuing challenge going forward. I guess, though, the, the one other point I want to just urge on all of you is that the architecture for the kind of hugely expanded efficiency and renewables investment that both Lloyd and I want to see really is in place today. Those Portland-based institutions I was listing off one after another are modular and expandable. And getting more resources into them now, seeing, for example, that the Oregon Energy Trust reaches its full potential as it begins to collect its resources for the first time on March 1, you're going to be seeing that name out there a lot, offering you things to do that are going to be good for you and good for Oregon. Watch for that logo and that name. And all of the institutions that I mentioned, we've got a lot to do to build them up if we do. We can get way beyond the floor levels, and we can reverse the awful collapse that both Lloyd and I referred to, the 80% loss of conservation investment after 1994. I'd like to see all of that back by next year, and I'm sure everyone here would then like to see it grow again. It's not like we were at a utopian point in 1994. If we simply pose the challenge that Don posed 20 years ago, let's do all the conservation that's cheaper than the generation we avoid then that's a challenge worth rising to and a challenge that will bring us to levels of investment far beyond what we've experienced in the past. Yeah. John Lieber, City Club member. Sir, I would just like to, before I state my question, to make a comment that I'm very happy being an Oregonian. <laughs> my question concerns California. Very good. And its two largest utilities, which have from what I have read in the paper, undergone just god-awful turmoil and uh, financial losses. What is, in your mind, the uh, financial stability of the utility industry in California, and uh, do you see them coming out of what, to me, almost is viewed as somewhere between a black hole and quagmire? Well, I, I want to begin by saying I, I do not think that David Letterman was correct in blaming the whole thing on the fact that every year summer takes the California utilities by surprise. <laughs> um, the, um, the fundamental reason why the 
California utilities were destabilized has to do with an odd feature of the California restructuring system that froze, as, as I think some of you are aware, that froze all of California's retail electric rates during the period that the wholesale market was first going up by a factor of five and then by a factor of ten. So the utilities were selling for eight cents something that cost fifty, and it's hard to make that up on volume. And uh, as a consequence, the collapse occurred in the early part of the year. Now what's happened since is that the freeze has been taken off. I mentioned my rather remarkable household electric rates. Uh, and as a consequence, a great deal more money is flowing into the utilities at the moment. Uh, I think the Southern California Edison Company was able to reach an accommodation with the Public Utilities Commission that I believe will keep it out of bankruptcy and after a difficult and rocky period, move it back to a more stable platform. PG&E's future is in doubt at the moment. The company's in bankruptcy. It's got a proposal to get out of bankruptcy pending before the bankruptcy judge. It's a controversial proposal. I, I will say this. I think that the long-term future of the hometown utility, public and private, the hometown distribution company, is actually, as a result of this catastrophe, somewhat brighter for this reason. There was a lot of loose talk and loose thinking uh, in the months leading up to the California restructuring about how these are really relatively unimportant institutions and the genius of the marketplace can replace them and who cares about them. Uh, and I think we actually all now are reinforced uh, in our sense that they do matter, that what they do is important, uh, and that we really aren't prepared to throw them over the side for an untested alternative. And that, I think, actually works to their advantage long term. Now, the great challenge for them is, can they develop a record as portfolio managers that responds to the extraordinary environmental commitment and sustainable energy desires of people like Oregonians? Because you are going to put high demands on them. You are not simply going to hand them the keys to the car uh, and open your wallet and walk away. And the test for them, uh, in terms of whether they do prosper going forward, I think, lies very much in what kind of portfolio managers they are. Can they exceed Lloyd Marbet's expectations and preside over the renaissance of efficiency and renewables that I've been talking about? Or will they get stuck in their old ways? Will they go back to the short-term thinking that produced the crisis? Because I think if that happens again, uh, a public willingness to dispense with them might very well revive. It's very much up to the utility sector, but there's never been a better time, I think, for them to step up, revive and re revitalize these commitments, and establish the kind of environmental as well as economic record of which we can all be proud. Mr. Cavana, I'm a little disappointed, I must say. Um, one of the key things that uh, brought about energy efficiency in, uh, in Oregon was the closure of the Trojan nuclear plant. And you failed to acknowledge those groups such as Lloyd Marbet, who went to jail to close a plant that was not only dangerous but very expensive. And it opened the door in our state to go to energy practices that were rent innovative, that were uh, pointed in the right direction, and we had tremendous opportunity to go forward. But instead, you chose to support mergers like Enron. Enron owns PGE. PGE is not secure by any stretch. We've had a 40% rate increase. And you talk about low-income people. Do you know how many small business people I talk to today that say, that's it. We've hit the max. We're going out of business, you know? And yes, I do have a question. And, and my question is, I have a quote here. It's important to establish, because this man has a reputation in the Northwest. He's influenced policy for a long time. And there are times when a person has to be held accountable. When the infant 104th Congress went to town on the nation's environmental laws, we appealed for help from corporate community, Kavanaugh says. And this was quoted in the Cascadia Times in March of 1997. Many former friends were consciously silent. Ken Lay, CEO of Enron, was extraordinarily honorable and initially lonely exception. And he is a part of the reason why the bad guys ultimately failed at most of what they attempted. He's also been a strong friend of renewable energy, an investor in wind and solar, and a progressive voice on global climate issues. On environmental stewardship, our experience is that you can trust Enron. So you said in 97 you can trust Enron. Right. And presently, Enron, okay. as we all know, is in trouble. Then let, let me respond. OK. My uh, question, no, oh. my, my question is, you supported deregulation. Enron was one of the companies that manipulated prices in California so that people were driven to very extreme situations. So my question is, can you please be accountable to decisions and choices in policy that you made, change that point of view, 
and make it something on a scale that will make a difference. Admit you made a mistake, change your point of view on deregulation, and move to better policy, because if we don't, Robert Barron's, it's old time, FDR knew about it, it's going to happen all over again, and it's going to keep happening. Uh, and now my brief response. <laughs> uh, I think accountability in the matter of the Enron PGE merger properly goes to the agreement that Portland General and Enron entered into under the auspices of the, Cal of the Oregon Public Utilities Commission five years ago in 1997, when some of you joined us in insisting to the Commission that if that merger was going to be approved, it had to be improved conditionally. And the conditions included extensive commitments on renewable energy, low-income energy services, and energy efficiency. And those in, in this room who are familiar with that agreement know that it was kept to the enduring benefit of equity and environmental interests in Oregon. Now, and again, this, this is a conversation we can continue, but the agreement is a matter of public record. It's important to note that in predicting that Enron would keep its commitments under that agreement, I was not vouching for the company's subsequent adventures in offshore subsidiaries. Uh, I would say today to all of you, in, in response also to the, uh, the, point, the quote that was read about what Ken Lay did in 1994 when environmental rules were under attack, uh, is that it is correct that he resisted it. It is also correct that Enron Wind, which was at that time, they became a subsidiary of Enron, became the largest and most aggressive wind developer in the United States and the only company that made its wind machines in the United States. Not everything that Enron ever touched was evil. And I think it is important to remember that even as we acknowledge today the urgent need to find a new steward. Enron decided to go out of the utility business more than two and a half years ago. It's time for them to leave. It's time for Portland General to find a new home. And I think there are probably in this room is a lot of gratification that I also feel that they appear to have found a pretty good one in another hometown Portland institution. And let's move as quickly as we can to get that done, and then we'll think further long term about whether Lloyd's vision makes sense. But right now, I think we need to get the hometown utility back in hometown ownership. That ought to be the common effort. And for those of you who want to look back at the Oregon uh, agreement back in 1997, I'd be glad to provide a copy in aid of Nancy's accountability. Now, Mr. Chairman, I believe we may have reached the close of my time. Uh, well, time for one more question, I Oh, believe. very good. Lloyd Anderson, City Club member. Yes, Lloyd. Uh, the President announced that he was going to use hydrogen as a source of energy for driving cars. That uh, splitting of, 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 of oxygen, or, uh, of uh, H, C, uh, H2O into, uh, into hydrogen is going to take energy. What's the source of that, and what effect will it have on power in the Northwest? Well, that is, of course, the crucial question, and usefully it allows us to end by focusing on the very far forward future. There's enormous appeal in running vehicles off of hydrogen. The waste product is water. The problem is getting the hydrogen, which the hydrogen is not really an energy form. It's a form of energy storage, and you've got to do something. You've got to generate energy to make the hydrogen. The hydrogen enthusiasts hope to do it with renewable energy resources, and so the best hope for a environmentally sound hydrogen-based future is the near-term explosion, for example, of wind power, not just in the United States, but nationally. If we have an environmentally benign source of renewable power available to make hydrogen, then obviously the promise of a hydrogen future is a whole lot brighter and more plausible. But that's the real issue. If we simply rely, for example, on the existing electric generating base, more than half of which is coal-based, and we make hydrogen with that, we will succeed in making worse many of the environmental challenges that I've tried to speak to. And one in particular that I want to leave you with is that in the last decade alone, the electric generation sector across the U.S. increased its carbon emissions by a full 25 percent. That's more than three times the rate of growth for the rest of the economy as a whole. That electric generation sector has to be the focus, for those of you who care about the global climate challenge, uh, of long-term solutions. And that, for me, is one more reason to take this electric resource portfolio management challenge all the more seriously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. With that, uh, we are adjourned.